Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Welcome to part two of Wild Awakening with Greg J. Matthews. On the last segment episode, we heard about the bear attack and we heard about Greg's recovery and getting home to his family in Texas. And then all of a sudden, everybody was asking him, Greg, you got to tell the story. You got to tell the story. Well, as Greg said in the last episode, the bear attack really isn't the story. So Greg, bring us up to speed of what the real story is. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Bruce, for having me back on. And sorry to leave your listeners, your viewers. Oh, I got to pause them. Just pause. So uh, when I arrived back home, it was obviously a very surreal time for me because I was still trying to process the whole attack and surviving that. And uh, everybody, well, literally, we had meals come to our house for probably about 40 days from our neighbors. And everyone wanted to hear the story. And I was, being a firefighter, we had the brotherhood of, I could talk to firefighters about things that I've been through and things that I've seen. And that helped. And I really didn't have an outlet except sharing just the trauma of what I went through. And each time I looked in their eyes, I was just searching for something that said that they understood what I had gone through. And it's not their fault. I mean, nobody that I know else has been attacked by a grizzly. And so it, it was very difficult to be able to have any type of therapy and being able to share that with them and, and get any type of response back. It made me feel better. And so I decided to write because not only was the grizzly attack and the trauma of all that, but I can't tell the story without talking about God showing up. And I can't talk about God showing up and all that he did without talking about some of the things that when you read the book, you'll find out that I'm very transparent in the book. It was time to get honest, not only with myself, but with everybody around me about some of the wounding that I had suffered as a kid that had basically plagued me like a cancer for my whole adult life. And so a lot of people ask on the book, they understand the grizzly attack, but what they don't understand is how does a raging grizzly attacking me, how does it heal me? And what I can tell you is that when I was eight years old, I was out there on the sidewalk with my brothers. We were playing some wiffle ball. And I had two other brothers. They were younger than me. And my dad came out carrying some boxes. And uh, of course, I think I told you my dad was a Marine, worked for the California High Patrol, and then worked for NCIS. So two full careers in law enforcement. So very much an alpha male, very much somebody I just idolized. He was my hero. He was my anchor. And when we saw him carrying those boxes, it's like we knew that we need to help him because we just, we love that wink. We love that smile. We love that approval from him. We lived for that. So we rushed in the house and here was all these boxes in my parents' room. And so we're running out and loading up his car and not understanding what we are carrying or anything like that. So it came to a point where we finished loading the boxes and we we're so excited waiting on the sidewalk as my dad carried out the final box. And uh, he opened the door and set it in there and walked around the car. His head was down and I looked at him because I was expecting to see a smile or a thank you, good job, guys. His head was just kind of hung and he walked over to the car door and opened it. And I said, Dad? And he looked up. I'll never forget it because my world just it disintegrated. The whole foundation of who I was just completely vaporized when he said, boys, your mother and I, we still love you very, very much, but I'm not going to be living here anymore. And my brother, Shane, he started crying and was saying, dad, please don't leave. I was wanting to scream it and I couldn't say it. I couldn't fathom. I couldn't believe it. And the only thing I could think of that was that I had done something so terribly wrong that it was just unforgivable and that my dad was leaving the house because of me. And this is an eight-year-old boy trying to process this. So my brother's crying. I'm in shock looking at my dad and he climbs in the car and starts it up and drives away. And I watch and he doesn't look back. And right there, I was like, my whole world just came crashing down. 
And as an eight-year-old boy, the only way that I could process that I had done something terrible, something unforgivable, my dad didn't love me enough to stick around, and that, that I was just unlovable, that I was unworthy of anything. And I can remember thinking that if dads can leave, then anybody can leave, and I will never, ever trust anybody like that again. Want to become a smarter deer hunter? Know when to hunt, where to hunt, how to hunt? Well, Deer Hunting Institute Part 1 was created to do exactly that. Because many people have told me they struggle with spending all days in the wood and never seeing a deer. Only shooting does and young deer. Leaving the woods empty-handed way too many times. Found this wonderful, but just couldn't get on them. Having difficult finding a place to hunt. Recognizing possible mistakes you're making every year. Having tried and failed to find qualified mentors who deliver results. If you had these frustrations or struggles, go to DeerHuntingInstitute.com and there you'll find a 13-module course to help you solve these problems. Again, go to DeerHuntingInstitute.com and find some answers. I told myself that the only thing that I could do was to try and prove myself worthy of love and recognition. For the rest of my life, I would pursue that, trying to prove to my dad that, because the whole thing I was thinking as he was driving away is, dad, I'll be good. I promise. So as my world is crashing down, I'm writing these lies on my heart that says there's nothing good in you that you have to go out and you have to make your mark and you have to prove to the world and you have to prove to your dad that there is value in you, that you are something that, and someone that can be loved. And so, as you can imagine, as an eight-year-old boy, I never told anybody what I believed from that point on. And so, from that point on, whether it was baseball or anything that I did, including, I mean, the laundry list of careers that I pursued and, and the fire service and fugitive recovery and homeland security and emergency management and helicopter rescue. It was the reason I did those things. Although I did help a lot of people, I pursued those things from a very, very broken area in my life. And that was just an area of just being unworthy. And I'm sure for you guys watching this and gals, that this is striking a chord and it's probably hard to watch because I know that there's a lot of father wounds out there for both men and women. I know that this is part of the reason that this grizzly attack happened to me because what I've laid out for you is the framework of what can you imagine, and maybe you can because you have your own woundedness that you've carried in secret. One, to carry anything in secret is terrible. The other thing is that you have to remember that there was never anything. It was like fire is all consuming. It's never satisfied. As long as you continue to throw whatever, wood, it will burn it. It's all consuming. That's the same way when you're pursuing material things, when you're pursuing achievements, when you're pursuing success. I kept reaching that point where people are like, that's unbelievable that you accomplished that. And then it would pass and I would be like, I need to be recognized. I need to be loved. I need to do something greater. I need to do something more. And so there was never any satisfaction. So I carried this weight that nobody knew about for my entire adult life. And I also mirrored what I knew about my dad. And I had to tell you right now, what an eight-year-old boy writes on his heart has nothing to do with how his dad really feels about him. And I didn't find that out until after the grizzly attack that an eight-year-old boy doesn't know how to process that stuff. Nine-year-old, seven-year-old boy, it doesn't matter. You don't know how to process that stuff. You only have limited ability to answer the questions. And I told you how I answered the questions. And so I carried that darkness and that weight through all of my relationships, through everything. People paid the price because Greg had to be the best. Greg had to be at the top. And it didn't matter how I got there because It wasn't the position at the top that I wanted. It was the love. It was the affirmation. It was that Greg is okay. And now dad would say, okay, now I believe you. Now you said you would be good. 
and now you are being good. It's really, it's difficult to talk about, but the more I talk about, the more freedom there is in pressing into that pain. And so I'm, what I want to tell you is my dad is my best friend in the whole world. Him and I are closer than we have ever been. It was what I wrote on my heart. It wasn't what he was telling me. It was what I was telling myself. And so you need to remember that when you're dealing with wounds from childhood, you go into this thing called arrested development. You don't grow from those areas until you face it, until you talk about it, until you come to peace with it, and until God basically restores you from it. I don't know any other way to say it. It's a long, hard path but it is so worth it. And so now you see the framework. Now you see the grizzly attack. When God showed up, I was on my hands and knees. I was bleeding. I could hear it. I couldn't see it. I was bleeding from my neck. I could hear the blood pooling underneath me. Literally, that's how much was flowing out of my neck. And I thought, that's it. Greg cannot do any more circus tricks. Greg cannot achieve anything. Greg is done. And I know from eight years old, nobody's going to be there to carry me because I let the bear get the drop on me. I failed. I'm injured. I've done wrong. Whatever, my decisions, whatever, not being able to avoid it, whatever it is, I had arrived at a point where I had done wrong and that there was nothing worth anybody stepping in to save Greg. That's where I was. But that is where exactly where God my dad in heaven, who I had accepted Christ in my junior year of high school. And I loved him and he loved me. And I know that accepting Christ as my savior, I know I was going to heaven, but I kept my dad and I kept the Lord at arm's length because I I could not not believe the lie that I had wrote on my heart about unworthiness and unlovable and that no one is going to be there. I can rely on no one but myself. And so when I was thinking that I was drawing my last breath, ultimately my last breath is where God wanted me because Greg had nothing left to give. All I could do is look up to heaven and basically take my last breath and die. And God stepped in with unbelievable, and I mean unbelievable miracles, to show me that What I had believed from my dad leaving and had overlaid on my relationship with God, those lies that my dad and my dad in heaven thought I was nothing worth loving, that I was unworthy, that I was nothing worth sticking around for, he totally wiped that away because he showed up when Greg could not do anything else. When he and anybody, including God, would show up the only reason that he would do stuff like he did with the miracles in my life and being able to survive that brutal attack and the walk back out and the hypothermia on the beach and thinking they were going to leave me or he was going to have to leave me on the beach to go get help and having to look down and sight down that rifle and imagine that bear coming up the beach. He was there throughout the whole entire thing. He gave me a vision of my family. He gave me a vision of my daughter calling to me, saying, Daddy, you have to fight to come home to us. Clear as day. And I'm telling you, you look at my bona fides and what I've done with my life and the seriousness of the things that I've taken on. And I'm telling you right now with the seriousness of all those things, God showed up. This is not my book. This is not my message. I shouldn't be here. I should be dead. And the fact is that I have always been a helper and a protector, and this has given me the mission that I should have had my whole entire life. One is loving Greg for who he is and knowing that I'm loved by my dad in heaven and my dad, but two, really working to help people heal from wounds that they walk around with every day that are killing them inside, that are killing their marriages, that are killing the relationships with their kids. I even made a decision during this whole process of being so jacked up in the head from that wound. I was married for seven years, and she loved me deeply. And I refused to have children because I was convinced I would never, ever be a good dad. It just breaks my heart to even talk about it now because of the fact that it's, yeah, she loved me. 
And all she wanted was to do what married couples do, and that's have children. But I was convinced I would overlay that pain and that wound, and somehow I would not be around, or somehow they would grow up and be convinced that they were unworthy of love, that I had failed, that I had broken them somehow. And I was convinced I would never, ever, ever do that. And so I had to make a decision, and she wanted to have children, and so we ended up getting a divorce over that. And so it's, there's a lot of burning wreckage in my life from a wound that I wrote on my heart a long time ago. And I'm not going to ruin the book for you because there was multiple miracles. The blood that erupted from my face and blinded me and the ringing in my ears from the shock. I felt the Lord come in behind me and hold me when that bear was ravaging me for over two minutes. And you know what? I haven't had a single nightmare. That is just one small miracle, not a single nightmare. And he shrouded my eyes and guarded my ears from the most terrible points of that attack. And it goes on from there and there throughout the walk out. I collapsed twice. When I finally made it to the boat, there's miracle after miracle after miracle. And then I will tell you that there was something that happened in the hospital that will absolutely blow your mind, but I'm telling you right now, it's the absolute truth. Do you want to become a smarter white deal hunter, knowing when to hunt, where to hunt, how to hunt? Over the past four years, people have asked me, hey, I'm struggling with spending all day in the woods and never seeing a deer, only getting opportunities at doe or young bucks, leaving the woods empty-handed too many seasons. Located the deer of a lifetime, but just flat out missed. Having difficulties finding a place to hunt, recognizing mistakes that you're making over and over again, and you want to eliminate them. Having tried and failed to find qualified mentors. Well, you've come to the right place. Why? Because Deer Hunting Institute Part 1 was created by me, Bruce Hutchin. It's a 13-module course that'll talk about being lost in the deer hunting forest, never edited hunted, what is a hunter, what is an adult onset hunter, what rules apply, finding a mentor, choosing a weapon, finding a place to hunt, scouting a hunt location, stand sites, stand access and exit, reading signs, and when to hunt. All these are available for you at deerhuntinginstitute.com go now to deerhuntinginstitute.com and sign up for the best deer hunting course in america god showed up in a way that i could never even imagine and he wiped all that pain all those lies away from my heart and today I live in freedom. From that, the enemy has been bound and cast to the pit, him and his lie. I will tell you that I have never experienced any time in my life a sense of purpose and fulfillment and joy. And it doesn't come from, I could just like probably a bunch of you out there, whether it's business or being a first responder or a pilot or whatever, we could talk at length about the things that we've done. And, and when I was dying and I thought, okay, this is it. And I started thinking about all the things that I had achieved and accomplished in my life. I can absolutely tell you right now that those things do not mean a thing when you are looking death straight in the face. And so why should we not live that way? Like Tim McGraw, his song, Live Like You Were Dying. If we all live like that, I wish I could all give you those last moments of my life that you could live them, not to scare you, but so you could have that awakening that I had as to what really, really matters in life. And that's a relationship. I'm not talking about church. I'm not talking about praying. I'm not talking about a Bible. Those are elements that you pursue because you want to be closer in intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. But the fact is that relationship with God, that relationship with your wife, with your kids, that is what God created. And that is where purpose and fulfillment I have found for me. That's where it lies. And so I had traded treasure for trash for too long while the Lord and my family waited on the sidelines cheering me on, 
encouraging me when all they wanted was for me to invest as much as I had invested in all those other things that didn't mean anything. They wanted me to invest in them, in conversation, in relationship, in being present, in being attentive, in, in trying to establish things to be a godly leader in my family. All of those things that I had just maintained and had pursued all those, all my heart was pursuing those other things. In the end, I can tell you it doesn't mean anything. You need to hear that and you need to listen to what I'm saying because what I'm saying is absolute truth. Those things, when it all comes down to it, they mean nothing. The relationships is where you find purpose, where you find that fulfillment that we're all looking for, man and woman. We're all looking for that stuff. And so that is how the grizzly, I don't compare myself to the Lord, but these wounds like I showed you, that I wear on my arm. I don't even know if you can see that one. I call that my Jesus wound because that's where the fangs came all the way through my arm. I love my wounds. And the only reason I love my wounds is because when I look at them, I know that they have brought healing and they have restored me and they have healed the broken heart of a little boy that didn't know how to be healed, was pursuing what he thought was love when in fact it wasn't. And you know that there's someone else who wears scars, who has healed people, who has brought life, who has brought restoration. And I know he wears his scars with pride and is thankful for those scars because those scars were put there so that we could have eternal life. We could have that dad relationship, that ultimate father relationship that we all long for. Even if your dad left you, if your dad passed away if your dad was present but absent, if you have abandonment issues, if you have any of those things, and I could go on and on and on, you have an opportunity to have the perfect dad relationship where you can crawl up on his lap. You can approach the throne because when he sees you, he sees Jesus Christ. And the fact is that has paid the price. Those scars, just like my scars, remind me of a price that was paid for restoration in life. That's exactly true. You have the ability to march up there to the creator of everything, the king of kings, your dad, throw your arms around him and receive not shame, which is what we're all used to drawing on and keeping us from having those relationships, is all the shame from the woundings and all the hurts that have been through our life. Now we get to receive and if you want to study something, study grace. And you dads out there that have kids, you know what I'm talking about with grace because your love can never change for your kids. doesn't matter what they do. doesn't matter how bad they are. doesn't matter anything. They could be in prison and your love never changes. Well, that's just a small microchasm of how much God wants that relationship with you and how he wants to love you in a personal, personal relationship where you can just talk to him and you can share everything that you're hurting about. You can share all those joys and he will walk beside you. It's about the relationship. It's not about religion. That's how I was healed. And I'm so glad that I've been given the opportunity to share that with you. And I just want you to know with Wild Awakening, there is so much to unpack there. But what it reveals is the ultimate dad that loves us more than we can even imagine that wants to come into every single detail of your life and be as real as the conversation that we're having right now. Greg, how does somebody get the book? It is available. I don't know if I mentioned this, but I did an audio book also. So it's in the author's voice. You get the inflection, you get the being choked up. It was hard to get through it. So they can get that on Audible, which I think is through Amazon. But any bookstores that sell books, the book is out there. Uh, right now, it's on the new release table. The Lord has really blessed it in a number of genres. It's a bestseller, new release on Amazon. You can get it on Google Books, any place that sells books right now. And also, you can go to my website, which is https colon forward slash forward slash chase what matters dot today. And you can order it there. You can find out more about my speaking events where I'm going to be, I'm going to start some blogging. This is all just, it's starting to explode now. 
and I'm getting some tremendous feedback from all ages, all male and female. It's, this is God's message, and I'm just going to be the conduit. And whether it's one person or a thousand people or 10,000, I want to be the conduit to share the story that the Lord has given me and how he saved my life, Bruce. Hey, thanks for listening to the show tonight. Before we go, can I take a moment and say thank you? Listen, as we started the Whitetail Rendezvous podcast journey, we had no idea what to expect. But after four years, we received a ton of feedback from our over 400,000 listeners and climbing to half a million. Speaking of which, we are now closing in on over 600 featured guests. Thank you. And a quick shout out to all those who have left an iTunes review and your feedback. I get those and really appreciate it. And it's awesome to see what you have to say. And we do read every single one of them. And I just want you to know that I am incredibly grateful for your kind words regarding the show. And all of the ratings and reviews help us attract more listeners. And if you're one of those new listeners, welcome. Great to have you. By the way, if you haven't taken the time to rate and review our show and like the Hunting on Private Land strategy on how to get permission to hunt a private property, go to whitetailrendezvous.com as a special gift for just rating and reviewing our show. When you get there, look for the start button to get the details. Listen, I'll share you the top technique from some of the top hunters in the country on how do they get permission to hunt on private land. I'll share with you the exact techniques they use to get permission. As my way of saying thanks for rating and reviewing the show on iTunes. So join us next time. And remember, we're all on this journey together, learning, sharing, and becoming 365 Hunters. There's some people out there that this is resonating with more than one. So what Greg and I are going to do right now is just pray with you. And Amen. if you don't want us to pray with you, then click off iTunes or Stitcher or however you listen to it and go on with your day. But get the book, read the book, and then get in touch with Greg. Please do. Please or do. Or get in touch with me at Whitetail Rendezvous, and Greg can be reached at Greg at Chase What Matters. Dot today. Dot today. But Greg, why don't you just lead us in prayer for the people that are listening to this and give them the opportunity to give them their heart to Jesus. Absolutely. Dear Lord Jesus, I just thank you right now for this opportunity to pray to you as our dad and our father in heaven who knows us intimately. You know the very number of hairs on our head. You know the pain and the woundings that we have gone through because you have stitched us together in our mother's womb. You knew us before we were even born. And God, I just, I know what you have written on my heart. I know what you have done for me. I know what you have done to rescue me. I know the miracles that you perform. And I know that this message, Lord, is for somebody out there that you want to speak directly to. That it's time God has not given up on you. That he is not done with you. He needs you to fight right now. Fight for your family. Fight for your your relationships. Fight for your addiction over your addiction. And Lord, there is, I know for a fact that there is needs out there that you want to come to them as the ultimate dad. And God, I just ask, Lord, that you would touch them even now that you would touch their heart, that you would open them up to receiving that incredible gift of your love in their life, and that they would receive that incredible gift of your ultimate sacrifice for us, Lord, which is you sacrifice your son Jesus on the cross to die for our sins that we might spend eternity and we might live in relationship in this world, Lord, in the perfect dad relationship with you. And I know that there are lots of people who want that, God. And I just pray that they would just, Lord, in their mind, as they're listening, that they would just pray this simple prayer that, Jesus, I am a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner and that I am broken, that I have things in my life that are full of shame, that are full of wounds. And I know that in my mind, I probably think that there is no forgiveness for the things that I have done. But we know that that's not the truth. And we accept that gift that covers all of that sin and provides that pathway to that relationship with you. And I accept your son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior. 
And I know that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that I will spend eternity with you. It's just as simple as that. And I thank you that you have made it so simple, Lord. And I ask that you would touch hearts and you would anoint the words, God, that you have given me to carry this message of healing, to carry this message of restoration to everyone out there who's listening. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.